max fuel load of 200,000 pounds, which is about 31,000 gallons, we could take up to 83,000 pounds of cargo. Each engine had the thrust of 22,000 uh, pounds. The range, if we did not refuel, was 11,000 miles. And max speed at 30,000 feet was about 530 miles an hour. Boeing produced 732 of them starting in 1955 through 1964. It's always flew a plane that was my age or a little bit older. <laughs> uh, today, there's 396 of them in our inventory, 243 of which are uh, for the Air Force Reserve and Guard. So the Guard and the Reserves fly more than half of the tankers now. Um, but of course, over time, this aircraft's been upgraded. They no longer have navigators, um, and this is a newer engine version, and for navigation, GPS, and a lot of other things. Um, the tanker really is the Air Force's key to air superiority, and I'm going to freeze this one as soon as he. Mm -hmm. So, um, perfect. So, nothing in the Air Force gets accomplished without air refueling. Uh, I'll later talk about some operations I was involved in, but not many Air Force pilots, except tanker pilots, um, can claim so many different operations they were involved in because whatever operation happened, they had to have air refueling and a lot of them. Um, we had a saying, uh, so pardon my French, but in the tanker community, and Rob probably knows the same too, but nobody kicks ass without tanker gas. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so I paused it here. He's put the boom out. The, the boom is about 24 feet and can extend in and out about 12 feet. So the navigator, or now the crew, will conduct a rendezvous for whatever they're going to refuel, and they'll get an order. Let's say it's a B-52 and he wants 100,000 pounds of fuel. So we'll rendezvous, and then when that gets within three miles, then we will go to the speed that the B-52 wants to go, which I believe at that time was 275 knots. Then he knows how fast we're going, and then he gets to two miles, he does something, he gets to one mile. And then at one mile, because he's a thousand feet below us, he'll come up to uh, take fuel. He'll stabilize himself at 50 feet, so that the boom operator who's laying in this little area back here and is flying this and extending it in and out. So at 50 feet, the boom operator can, can bring him in and then, we, then they'll make a, a connection such that then they can offload the fuel we could give fuel on the larger airplanes at a rate of about 5,000 pounds a minute. <clears throat> so my first station as a navigator was Lytle Air Force Base, Arkansas. It's just in the, uh, below the Boot Hill, Missouri. And uh, I wanted to be a pilot, so I worked and got my private license uh, as quickly as I could and applied for UPT or pilot training. And then 86 was a big year. Our son was born. I was accepted to pilot training. And uh, I ended up in this Operation El Dorado Canyon, which I don't know if you folks remember, but it was a uh, Libyan raid when Muammar Gaddafi was. Uh, um, given the Navy fits down in Tripoli. 
and you know, uh, Commander Cleman, I don't know if you've read his story, but I'm in England getting ready for this refueling that's going to bring F-111s down to bomb Tripoli, but he was the one who shot down two of, of the living fighters. So, and I, I didn't even know uh, Commander Cleveland's story until I was with this project. But, so I thought it was very interesting for me personally. So I got accepted and off to pilot training and another change of bases and that's advanced Air Force Base in Oklahoma. Because I was a navigator for a few years, I show up for training as a captain. So now in a class of about 50 of us, I'm the senior ranking officer. I showed up at the building and there was a note waiting for me. Come see Lieutenant Colonel, can't remember his last name, as soon as possible. So I go to his office, Captain Schaefer, I've been waiting for you. And I'm like, great. <laughs> and, and he goes, well, he says, I just want to introduce myself. I don't know if you know it, you're the senior ranking officer and there's two things I need you to do. He says, you got to organize study groups and classes because this is, you know, it's, it, they found it in studying in groups and, and chair flying, uh, you do a much better job getting through the course. And two, I need you to explain to all the single pilots that for the next year we do not want them to get married. <laughs> and I'm like, I have to do this. He goes, well, you try it, and if you can't convince them, then you tell me and I'll organize the thing. We had three guys that went ahead and got married, and one of them washed out because he couldn't put in the time, or I don't think his heart was in the training. But, but anyway, so... Um, Another interesting thing is, you know, used to, I don't know if they do anymore, but you go to an air show in the Thunderbirds, and if you ever listen to some of the narration, they'll say that, well, in pilot training, all of our pilots are trained in these maneuvers that you'll see today, uh, the Thunderbirds perform. Of course, they're doing it at the surface, and we did everything above 10,000 feet, in case you messed up, but, but we did do, uh, a lot of those maneuvers. You were taught aerobatics and instrument training, formation flying, in those two aircraft. And then after that, I went back to flying 135s as a co-pilot. So, oh, so my wife was allowed to come up out to the flight line. So in the T-37, for the first aircraft you fly, she was able to take a picture of me after I soloed. So and made a big deal. And then. When you got back to the squadron room, all your buddies would grab you and they threw you in a dump. <laughs> sort, of, sort of Air Force tradition after you so. And towards the end of graduation, they march out to the flight line and you get a hero picture and you take one you. So after I went for co pilot, training in the 135, we ended up Warner Robins Air Force Base, Georgia. And I sort of had two lives there, so bear with me, but uh, I was a co-pilot in the tanker for a year. Uh, and in that year, because we were in the southeast, we were uh, involved in the uh, uh, Panama invasion, which uh, deposed uh, Noriega. And after a year as a co-pilot in the tanker, I went to uh, Central Command and flew an EC-135. I'll show you pictures later. And after a year at CENTCOM, upgraded to aircraft commander, which is Captain Lessie. And shortly after that is when Desert Shield Desert Storm kicked off. I ended up at three different bases moving around during that six month tour. Went to instructor school down in Fort Worth, Texas, Carswell for 
out there for instructor school, and as soon as I got back from instructor school, I was invited to come back to be the one of the three aircraft commanders for Central Command again at EC-135. And in that tour of flying the EC-135, it was for General Norman Schwarzkopf and Joseph Ward. So, KC-135, EC-135, co-pilot here, co-pilot there. Aircraft commander here, now aircraft commander there. So, it was just going back and forth. Um, so, when I had upgraded and was aircraft commander on the KC-135, we're going to talk a little bit about Desert Shield, Desert Storm. So, our unit was activated the second day after uh, Iraq evaded Kuwait. So, sort of a badge of honor, but the first units to get called are not fighters or bombers. or The first units that are called are actually KC-135 units because they've got to get the air refuelers in place so that they can bring the fighters and bombers and transport aircraft to the theater. So, we, on the, by the third day, we were in uh, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. On that first day, we won't, weren't, first day at the base, we weren't told where we were going to go. We, uh, uh, we got updated physicals, uh, shots, updated wills if you wanted to, uh, uh, power of attorneys, and my wife got a, had to get a power of attorney for my co-pilot because he was, his parents had passed away, and he ran a farm down in Kentucky. So he gave her two checkbooks and a power of attorney, and she's writing all these farm checks for hundreds of dollars and mailing them to the cousins that are taking care of the farm. So that's, anyway. Um, when we first got to Jeddah, our job was <coughs> to set up an air bridge so we would go into the Mediterranean and pull fighter, bombers, transport so that they could come into the theater, into Saudi Arabia. And the other thing we did was in the Red Sea was the uh, aircraft carrier Saratoga. So the Navy was really the first one sort of on the spot and we'd refuel them in what was called defensive counter air. So basically, they were a show of force to hopefully keep um, Gaddafi from coming south into Saudi Arabia. So if they were going to start pouring in into Saudi, the Navy was going to be there and do what they could to, but to get from the Red Sea all the way over to Kuwait, Takes every few months. Um, uh, another thing I wanted to say too is um, we deployed as a unit and we always came home as a unit. Uh, I think that was always better for moral support and cohesion. Cohesion. We didn't have a lot of substitution. Or there might be another unit there because the uh, Kansas Air National Guard unit was with us there but they were there as a unit too. So we didn't get pilots from all over the U.S. or whatever, and I thought that was a very uh, important thing. Now, all my flying occurs at like 25,000 feet down to 5,000 feet, and unlike some of the helicopter guys, you know, <laughs> flying at treetop level is not my sort of thing. <laughs> so, in Jeddah, this was the first place we come. Now, I don't know if you recognize it, but it's called the Hajj. So all the Muslim pilgrimage folks that have to go to Mecca, they go to, to this terminal called the Hajj, and then they're processed there. Well, <coughs> when we show up, of course, the pilgrimage is not going on, but that's where we are processed, and that was the first thing I saw as I taxied in was was this before we were um, processed. And this was my crew that I deployed. 
So the picture on the left is there in Jeddah, and it's uh, it's called the Lockheed compound. So in Saudi, a lot of times the people that work for them, they wanted to put in compounds. They didn't want us to be out walking the streets. So we were with Lockheed compound or Lockheed contractors because they had a lot of extra housing and they had these duplexes and it was great that the uh, Saudis bought us brand new beds to swap out and each crew got a duplex so me and my co-pilot each had our own single bedroom and living room and kitchen area and my navigator and boom operator had their own so it, it, it was very nice air conditioned and very good the only problem was oh we had good chow <laughs> but back in those days there was no FaceTime and there wasn't email but we felt very fortunate because the Lockheed compound had a telephone line mm -hmm. but with all of us that was there you could schedule a 20 minute phone call once a week mm -hmm. at about five dollars a minute mm -hmm. in 1990 dollars so probably what ten dollars fifteen dollars a minute now but it was well worth a hundred dollar phone call we'll call home uh, um, and periodically in Jeddah the bases would we'd have to fly a plane home because of mechanical issues or get it uh, serviced and the wise back at the base would find out there would be another plane to go back there so they could uh, give us um, they, they could pack a shoebox size gift to bring to us so we always like when that plane came because I know I was going to get a shoebox or something so. <laughs> and it could you know food and everything my like co-pilot always requested he he was a, a dipper but beach nut chew tobacco <laughs> all he wanted was his shoe box for my wife <laughs> then the other thing we did is we were at Jeddah for like four months as all this is going on and uh, our boss came to us and he says hey we're getting all these boxes of course we're mailing left and right back but we were getting boxes of mail for any uh, servicemen so people were writing us from the states and I so my boss is like you guys got plenty of time everybody grab a handful of these letters and write back to them and tell them you know appreciate your support and, and, and all this well one letter I sent was to a fourth grade um, uh, fourth grade kid in uh, Pennsylvania well his whole class is an assignment of like 20, 30 kids that wrote to any serviceman, but I was going one to him to send one back. Well, then <laughs> they all started writing me personally. <laughs> so I started getting 20, 30 letters, and I'm like, I can't write to 20 or 30 kids. So I wrote to the class once a week, and uh, the lady, the school teacher, sent me a nice thing, picture. Uh, after it was over. So. <laughs> anyway, so a couple weeks prior to kicking off Desert Storm, our unit was moved up to Riyadh, a little more forward, and there it was a uh, tent city. Now, the tents, not much protection, but uh, they were really nice. They had heat pump air conditioners. I mean, you could, you could run that thing down to 65 degrees, and, you know, and each crew got one tent. Um, but the other end of it too is because we were in Scud missile range you had flak vests and helmets and chemical warfare suits that have to be ready to use in case something happened and actually on the first day of the war and you know everything's busy but uh, Saddam kicks off these Scud missiles well, alarm goes off, alarm black, alarm black, and we're like, ah, oh, got to put my vest on, my helmet on, I'm getting my gas mask on. 
and we didn't really have a place to hide in those tents. And all of a sudden, the four biggest explosions I ever heard happened, you know, and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, this is, you know, so I was a little nervous. <laughs> Our crew was a little nervous. But what we found out later, because there was a Patriot missile battery only a mile away, and they didn't tell us, because we were with these Army guys, too, but when the Patriot missile launches out of the tube going after the Scud missile, that basically makes a sonic boom as this thing's going supersonic or something. So, so it was just them launching the Patriots, and it wasn't any, any impact. But after that, I'm like, all right, I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> So this is my little corner in that tent, and we would have little screens to sort of wall off. A lot of people slept with earplugs so they wouldn't hear all the tent stuff. And then this is a picture that was taken, me and my co-pilot, on Christmas Day, uh, and our unit was all in this one part of the tent city called Black Knight Country, or Black Knights. But uh, Budweiser, <coughs> because we couldn't smoke or drink in Saudi Arabia, Budweiser sent non-alcoholic beer by the pallet loads. So on Christmas Day, we broke open a non-alcoholic beer. <laughs> so the next few pictures are just gonna be uh, some of the planes we refueled. Of course, that's an A-10 War Warthog. And if you have questions about those planes or something later, you know, we can talk. One of the AWACS, this is a, AWACS is a airborne radar, so they direct a lot of the fight. They'll say there's bad guys here, go get them, or, you know, and they're a relay platform too. So whenever we flew, we always checked in with the AWACS and he would tell us various things. Uh, of course, we flew a lot of B-52s, so now it's what it looks like. But did a lot of B-52 refueling. This one on the left's got 250 pound uh, ordnance and the one on the right's got 500 pound ordnance. So. Sorry. Uh, F-4G on the left that flew a lot in Vietnam. The Air Force used them at that time as uh, they would go up and try and get radar sites to lock on to them because the missiles they had were called harm but it, it would follow that radar signature right to the target so those guys were used a lot and if there was any big uh, packages of airplanes that were going to go in and strike the F-4 was always around so in case somebody uh, tried to shoot them down that F-4 would get to them first that's an F-15 for air superiority. EA-6B is a Navy jamming airplane, so all the packages or all the flights that the Navy would do, that plane would be in the package somewhere trying to jam all the enemy signals. And I had to include this for all the Top Gun viewers uh, <laughs> that were at 14 back then, too. So. We fueled a lot of Navy. Now, the one on the left is a, a DC-10, but it's actually, in the Air Force, it's a KC-10. But they only made 60 of these. They're more expensive, but they were used a lot because it could take fuel, and then it could give fuel, and it could give fuel uh, simultaneously either to Air Force or Navy. So, it, uh, and then, Cargo-wise, it hauled three times more cargo than my airplane. F-16, now, all the, most of the time in my life in the Air Force was all spent in this area. So, call, and, and this is Central Command's area of responsibility. So, today, though, Central Command does not include Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, or, or Djibouti. But with uh, the general's team, I traveled to most all these countries except Iran and all the countries north of Afghanistan, all the other stands up here. So, um, 
Um, I guess Chris has my favorite place. I loved uh, Amman, Jordan. Uh, the people were, food was good. The people's very nice. Uh, uh, they enjoyed to try to talk in English. They wore a lot of English um, fashion. They, they liked everything that was uh, having to do with us being around. Um, so, after Desert Storm, went to instructor school and then got to come back to be one of uh, the generals, one of the generals three pilots. So, these are the, we call it the white top. We always took a crew of 16 of us, and then the general and his staff could have 20. So we were always <coughs> typically traveling 36. And because the general's based in Tampa, Florida, we had to have some way to get him to the Middle East and to stay in communication at all times. So this was the plane and the group to do it. And we always had to air refuel because with all the staff and the electronics and the radio gear, we had to have an air refueling to get to the lead. So we would work with a CENTCOM aircraft coordinator, and he was our go-between the general staff and us because we are based in Robbins. You know, I told you I flew all these planes in Georgia. Well, the plane belonged to the Air Force, but was paid for by Central Command. So, staff coordinator call up and say, Captain Schaefer, the general wants to go to Egypt on these dates and these times and give us exact times because we had to be at a place at a second if we could. And so the crew's responsibility then was to take what they wanted and so we organized air refueling, we organized uh, over flight clearances because if you're flying over certain countries you have to have a clearance to do that. Uh, we had to work with the embassy where we were going. There was always at the embassy an air attache. We're going to need so much fuel when we land. We're going to need dry ice. We're going to need uh, air conditioning carts. We're going to need auxiliary power units. You know, please have this on standby and available for us to use when we land. Those were just some of the things. So we planned this trip. The night before the trip, we fly the plane from Georgia down to Florida, where the general resides. The mechanics put it to bed. We get it fueled. The staff underlings bring all the generals and everybody that's their suitcases and everything out. We get the plane all loaded, ready to go. And then we go have dinner, go to bed, come back in the morning, everybody arrives, off we go. Um, another thing is I, we kept dual currency. So I could fly the white top and the tanker uh, at the same time, or, uh, and that uh, come out uh, important later. But I'm going to give you uh, some, maybe you know, source cost, a little bit of a fear of flying. So, two or three minutes before takeoff, we'd have to get on the inter intercom and say, three minutes prior to takeoff. And then he did some yoga or some breathing <laughs> or whatever. And then we took off. And then we didn't have to tell him when we were landing because when we put the gear down, he knew we were about to land, so we didn't have to make that announcement. <laughs> um, now, when I was a co-pilot, and I went on Schwarzkopf's first trip as a co-pilot. Now, the co-pilots, we were just radio guys. They, we never got to land the airplane or take off the airplane. It was always the aircraft commander while the staff was on board. So, but Colonel Bell was his executive officer. Now, the 135 had one air conditioner, or one pack, we call it. On its best day, 
you can keep the temperature in some 10 degree range. Because every time you did something with the power, it's going to get colder or hotter. <laughs> and there's only one switch up here for the whole airplane to change temperatures. <laughs> so Colonel Bell, after we landed on that first flight, bought a thermometer <laughs> with Velcro. And he took us back there and put that thermometer on the general's door and says, I want to see that at 70 degrees at all times. So we would have to send somebody back, 72 degrees, run to the front, turn it down a little bit. And then if we climbed or descend, we had to pull with that all over again. So anyway, so that's one of the first things. So he, when he went to Egypt and Jordan, he normally took a shotgun because they found out the general liked to dove hunt. Well, they had a lot of doves over there, and so some of these army guys, I don't know who, but I knew he took his gun with, would go out and shoot turtle doves. So that's, he liked doing that. Um, before the Gulf War, and when we were flying around, the big thing that was going on was, of course, the Russians were in Afghanistan, and we were trying to help the Afghanistan to get the Russians out. Well, they wanted to shoot down these helicopters and we had uh, a shoulder fired uh, uh, Stinger missiles, shoulder launch missiles that we started giving the Afghan through, but they would come to Pakistan, go through the Khyber Pass, and then they would take them to shoot them down. Well, Schwarzkopf wanted to take one of those missiles to show the four-star general in Pakistan. Well, the loadmaster come up front, and I, and I was a co-pilot, but Major Reardon was a commander, so he goes, Major Reardon, they got a missile on this airplane. <laughs> <laughs> and it was in like a 10-foot crate, and it was packaged right or whatever, but hauling passengers, you can't take stuff that's going to blow up or has the potential to blow up. But in the Air Force, everything's waverable. And we told Colonel Bell, he can't take that missile. Well, where's that written? We showed him in the regulations right here. But he found, he says, well, if I get a hold of basically the four star in charge of the Air Force, we can get a waiver, right? Yeah. It didn't take an hour. <laughs> and we had waiver and took the took it to uh, Islamabad, Pakistan. Um, he did not interact with the crew very much. Um, he would typically, at the end of a 12-day trip or something, he might come up and say, nice trip, guys, see you next time, or something like that. But, uh, but we didn't uh, interact very much. Um, his wife, however, was a ex-American Airlines flight attendant. She loved to fly. And every time she went on a trip, sometimes the embassy would invite his wife for whatever country to come. She'd bring us cookies. She loved air refueling. So when we turned the passenger seat light on, uh, she knew that air refueling was going to happen. She'd come up front and sit there and watch. So anyway. Now, uh, Joseph Hoare, was the second general. He was a, a Marine four star. And the only time there's two Marine four stars is when one of them's in charge of the Central Command. And uh, uh, we liked the Marine staff a lot more than the Army staff, but we'll all have to play and get along. So, anyway, I better. So, this is actually General Hoare here. So, a lot of the Places we went, we would get a reception like this. They, when he'd leave the aircraft or, or come onto the aircraft, it's first one off, last one on. Uh, and then uh, 92, 93, our final active duty assignment was we went up to Mountain Home Air Force Base to establish a new wing up there and then we decided after 12 years we'll uh, 
I could join the Air Force Reserve and keep flying, so that's what I did. We came back uh, to Indiana. So it was all flying tankers in Indiana. I was an instructor, evaluator. Um, the, the thing with aviators in the reserves is you had to give the wing at least six to eight days a month to keep your flying currency. And then you had to do a weekend drill. You've probably heard of that. So uh, between working at UPS and doing the reserves, I uh, wasn't home to, too terribly much. Uh, if we got one week <coughs> together, it was uh, sort of nice. But, uh, before I got at UPS, and when I first went to this reserve unit, I didn't have a job yet. I was filling out. Uh, applications for airlines and stuff. I took a six-month NATO tour for the Combined Air Operations Center. We called it the CAOC uh, during Operation Decisive Endeavors in Croatia when Bosnia and Croatia was and uh, enjoyed that tour. I got to sit at the desk with the general and everybody because tankers or fuel was so important and sometimes uh, decisions have to be made quickly on whether there's enough people to do this mission or that mission and stuff. So I, I liked it. Uh, while we're at the CAOC, lots of screens, a lot of things going on with the Army and Navy and Air Force. And, but one screen, and in this, was when drones first started. So this one screen is always fuzzy. But when it cleared up, and you saw this little picture of a runway, all these people started coming out of the woodwork or out of the back because they knew there was going to be a drone launch. Well, in those days, you wheeled this drone, you know, out to the runway and get it all set up, and they're doing tests and one thing or another. And then, but what people were coming up front to watch is it to take off. So here's a, like a 300-foot wide runway, and this drone would go 100 feet this way, 100 feet that way. It'd go down, and everybody's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then all of a sudden, it'd go, zoom, and everybody go, yay. <laughs> so it, it didn't crash. And then, then we could see what the drone was looking at. And, but uh, that was before they started arming and stuff. And then the real fun was when they'd come back to land. Of course, they put a big barrier up, a big net barrier. And this thing's coming down, you know, and everybody's like, oh, oh. It hit, bounced a few times, and wham, right into the net. <laughs> so, anyway, and the best thing is, it, this was at Vicenza, Italy, where I was doing this. Uh, my wife had come over to visit for a couple of weeks. We had a great Italian vacation. So, uh, in the reserves, and this is basically after 9 11. So I got activated for two years. So 9-11 hits, two days later, we get orders, RIQ reserves, you're back on active duty for two years. And on the second day after 9-11, we got a pretty good deal, but we all flew to Hawaii and we're refueling transport aircraft that were taking supplies and stuff to Diego Garcia. I don't know if you know where that is, but it's an island uh, just south of uh, India. So they were supplying uh, because they knew they were going to start doing things in Afghanistan and, and in uh, Iraq. But uh, I had here just uh, well, my plan was to retire in 2001, but in, in like another month after 9-11. But when you get those orders, you get stop loss. So no pilots could leave the reserve or the Air Force until they said, so I was stuck in for another couple of years. But after 9-11, I'm not complaining. But, but we just plan our retirement a little bit later. <laughs> So that's my crew in Hawaii. 
So, in Hawaii, I don't know how long, a few months, they actually have a guard unit that is KC-135 in Hawaii. They call them the Hang or Hawaii Air National Guard. They weren't activated, but they were afraid they were going to get activated, which means they couldn't be airline pilots and all this, and they saw these two-year activations. So they said, well, kick the Grissom guys off of Hawaii, and we'll do all this stuff here, but, but just don't activate us. And so some general said, all right, we'll kick Grissom guys out. How about you guys go to Guam? So we uh, go to Guam. And of course, the mechanics, like, you know, when you go to the uh, hangars and stuff, you know, we, every place we ever went, it's, you know, 100 miles to here, 10,000 miles to home, or, or whatever. But the one side story, too, is I don't know if you've heard about brown snakes in Guam. Well, once upon a time, Australia brown snake comes on a boat to Guam that has a lot of birds and the snake's very prolific and it can climb trees and almost completely decimated the bird population in Guam. So they trap these now with a vengeance. So all around the base, probably four feet high and every two or three feet is a fish trap with a mouse in it and these snakes climb up the fence into the uh, fish trap uh, the mouse is in a little box, so he never gets the mouse. <laughs> but then they go around the perimeter every day and pick these snakes up, and we find out where the snakes were, so on some time off, we got to go see them. <laughs> I'm going to have to. So after Guam, we got rotated to um, Qatar to be in place for all the stuff that's now going to happen as far as uh, um, Operation uh, Iraqi Freedom and Operation Afghanistan Freedom. So once again back in tents, and this was my crew. To now, get to the, so now, back in 1997, uh, on April Fool's Day, April 1st, 1997, I got a call from UPS. Hey, we want you to come to work. I said, you realize this is April Fool's Day, right? Is this real? And, and, and the lady didn't even get it. I'm like, going, <laughs> but, but she goes, no, it's real, or whatever. So, so I started as flight engineer because they had flight engineers in those days co-pilot, and I could still commute to Louisville as a flight engineer or a co-pilot. But once I took, well, once we started getting newer airplanes, they domiciled them in Anchorage, Alaska. So now to get to work, well, from my farm here now, it's 13 hours to get to work. Drive four and a half hours to Louisville, get on a plane, UPS plane, ride with the guys or gals to Anchorage, and then I could start my trip. So, I'm only going to talk about our latest, newest, this is 747-8, uh, max takeoff weight of 987,000 pounds, 66,000 pounds of thrust, 59,000 gallons of fuel, range of about 7,800 miles. Cruise speed is 0.85 miles to 35,000 feet, and we can carry up to 300,000 pounds of cargo. Wingspan, 224 feet, the length 250, and to the top of the tail was 64 feet. So, this is at Oshkosh last year, and I'm sure some folks have been there. This is uh, Boeing Plaza, where Boeing sponsors and pays for all these nice Boeing aircraft. So this is the 747-8, and it's a Dash 8 because it's made with the 787's design wing. As you look, the wing 
both looks similar. Now, the 7 4 wings larger, but it's the same design. And this was my KC-135 from refueling days. So you can see that this plane is about three times larger than the KC-135. And we have a new tanker that is coming online, and it's a 787. <coughs> so both tankers, the 787 and the Dash 8. So this is a picture of a 200 or a much older uh, version on the left taken off out of Anchorage. And I had the opportunity, so this is Hong Kong. Um, so this was at the old airport, uh, Kai Tech. There's a new airport now. But we used to fly into there, and you would fly an approach to a side of the mountain to get you through these hills. And you would get to roughly 500 feet, and then the airport is 90 degrees to your right. So you're 500 feet and turning and going into an 8,900 foot runway, which for 7 4 is not very long. <laughs> and captains were required to make the landing, but because it's a right turn, when you roll the wing up right, the captain can't see the runway because the captain's up here. So the most good captains would have the co pilot start the turn. And when the captain could see the runway, then he'd go, I have the airport. <laughs> that made fun. Um, so the airport closed two days after that photograph. And we went out to much nicer 12,000, about 300 foot wide runway. But there's all these people here. They had a party for like a month and would fill these rooftops with people drinking and taking pictures of stuff because they knew the airport was going to close. Um, so I flew mostly international, China, Asia, India, Middle East, and Europe. My favorite place was Hong Kong. I actually took my wife there for a vacation once. Uh, and Cologne, Germany, I liked. My least favorite was uh, Mumbai, India, or it used to be called uh, Bombay. My typical schedule was to go for 10 to 14 days in a row so I could be home for five to eight days in a row. So I wasn't just commuting back and forth all the time. We'd have a crew of three. Well, I'm sorry. <clears throat> this takes two to fly, but if our flights are longer than eight hours, I would get a second co-pilot. If the flight's longer than 12 hours, you get three co-pilots. So we could, and we had bunks in the airplane and a lot of times try to say, but we could get some rest and we would divvy up the flying and stuff. And I wouldn't necessarily be needed unless something uh, was wrong with the airplane, then they'd call me and I'd have to come up front and uh, deal with it. Um, you would typically, so these planes only sit on the ground a couple hours because they're refueling, putting more cargo, and off they go. So we'd land, go to the hotel, crew would come out of the hotel, fly that airplane on, and 16 to 24 hours later, you were the guy that would come out and catch the next flight to go on to the next destination. So you would island hop that way, and typically make a big circuit. So I'd go from Anchorage, Alaska, to Asia, Middle East, up to Germany, and then come back that same way, because cargo flowed from Asia to the U.S. and from Asia to Europe and in, back into Asia as well. Uh, this is the main deck cargo, so as you can see, uh, that's, you can have containers up to 10 feet tall. Uh, there were there's 36 pallet positions up on the main deck, and I think 12 in the lower deck. So some of the cargo, you, you tell what that is, it's bees. So I've hauled bees from Portland, Oregon to Anchorage. I've hauled uh, tropical fish from South America to Japan. I've hauled lab mice. Uh, 
apples and bean cherries from Washington to China. So just Maine lobsters. Chinese love Maine lobsters. So a, a lot of lobsters go, go to China. Um, a few months before I retired, I took the family up for a vacation so the grandkids could, could uh, go around the airplane. That, you know, they looked around and like, oh, this is okay. But in the back of the airplane, what they liked the most was we've got two bunks back there and it's a, its own little room. <laughs> and so they go, oh, we got the bunks. We stay in the bunks. <laughs> anyway, so um, my last flight was actually to Cologne, Germany from Dubai. And uh, then they were uh, going to ferry me or jump seat me back, back home. But this was the crew that I crewed with on that last flight. And I didn't know, because <coughs> so sometimes when you retire, if the fire department's available, you get this salute from the fire department. Well, I'm in Germany. And, but UPS asked the Germans if, if, if available. This is Captain Schaefer's last flight, and they, they did that. But, this young lady here is also a KC-135 unit, uh, or KC-135 aircraft commander from uh, Arizona Air National Guard in Phoenix, and he's with the Terre Haute Air National Guard as well. Now, he isn't a pilot for Air National Guard. He works with the 101st Airborne. He's a weather officer. So he can be, <coughs> if they're going to take an airfield and set up air operations, He's like a controller and the weatherman and has to parachute in with the army guys. It's crazy. I said, dude, you need to retire. <laughs> and finally, uh, so this is, if I can find it, this is, I took a, a, a video, cell phone video. This is the cockpit as we're ready to disembark. Oh. I don't know what this <laughs> uh, we've only got a couple minutes. Are there any questions, or if somebody has questions, I'm willing to stay afterwards or something. But I don't want to take up any more time. But yeah, that's sure. a question. Um, how long have you been in? Uh, if I understood you, uh, you say you was in England at the time that uh, Mr. Kleinman had shot down those uh, two. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I the way I read his because. We were there for that raid, and those we know those planes were shot down just right before we did that raid. Uh, Bob, uh, how long have you been in uh, England at that point? So we went for six weeks. So it was right before I went to pilot training. So what happened, we had a lieutenant colonel that was coming to Blyville to be the squadron commander. Well, he got there like two or three months before his predecessor was ready to leave. Well, having a couple colonels bouncing into each other, so what they said is they go, hey, we need a tanker over in Milton Hall, England. Schaefer, you're getting ready to go to UPT. Why don't you and Colonel Reagan go over there for six weeks before he resumed uh, responsibility and before I left for UPT. So, but we didn't know what was ultimately going to happen. And we had to stay about a week extra uh, to fulfill that mission. And, and, and that was uh, in the summer of 81, correct? You know, but when she... 86, it was like... Uh, uh, but she passed away in 85. Well, then I might be mistaken about the two he shot down in. But, or John... Uh, I just had another question for you. Oh. Uh, uh, were you flying on September 11th? Oh, well, no. Well, yes. So <laughs> what had happened, uh, I was on my way to get a flight physical at a doctor's office in Fort Wayne. And, uh, and this, my doctor was actually the uh, Air Force Reserve doctor at the base we were at. Anyway, I'm going to get a physical, my wife calls me on the cell phone and says, Ken, the plane just flew into the World Trade Center, and she's asking me, well, would a guy get that lost? And I said, well, you know, I don't, 
LaGuardia, I'm trying to thank you. I'm like, oh, I don't know. Well, I, I get to the doctor's office, and of course we know each other, and he says, hey, come to the office, did you see? And about the time we got in there, he had the TV, the second one hit. So, and then we're like, well, that's not a coincidence or whatever. And then, um, within the hour, uh, navigator at the base called me because he knew I lived close. We had always had a list of who lived real close to the reserve unit. And he called me and says, hey, are, are you at work or are you at home? I said, well, I'm on my way home from Fort Wayne. And he goes, what are you doing about 4 o'clock tonight? I said, uh -oh. nothing. And so, uh, so we refueled the Fort Wayne Air National Guard unit that was flying cap around the um, Sears Tower because they were trying to think what would be other targets. So Fort Wayne was basically protecting Chicago, and we were given the fuel to do it. And it was interesting because we were absolutely the only airplanes in the sky. The air traffic controller said, you just go wherever you want, find <laughs> wherever you want, and we'll just watch you, but there's nobody else out there. So it's, it was sort of crazy. How would you compare the write-ups in the log books of the military aircraft and the civilian uh, You know, because we, we had a lot of mechanics for UPS to work, ex-military too. Uh, what I remember in the Air Force a lot was um, because money was tight and stuff, if, if let's say if co-pilots, ADI wasn't working exactly right, instead of just putting a new one in, they would move it to the captain's side and put the captains over here and try to see if the write-up come up again. And I remember that happened a lot. Uh, now, at UPS, the mechanics could say could not duplicate, or they would um, um, MEI it, or minimum equipment list. So there's a lot of, there's a whole book the FAA does for the 747. So there's some things we can fly without that's not too important. Now you can't fly without one of your motors, but there might be something else. So uh, because these planes are only on the ground a couple hours, but if they could MEL it, or minimum equipment listed, they would try and fix it back in Louisville. Then. But some things had to be fixed. And, but now, with that 787-8, it's satellite linked to Louisville every second. So if a, you have a brake failure or some circuit breaker pops, Louisville maintenance knows it. And, you, and we could call them to say, because the computer might just say, Brake limiter. Well, we could call Rule, and he goes, "Yeah, it's just one brake, number <laughs> 16, in your main body gear left." You know that we could. It was never an issue because Boeing did their braking, figuring that two brakes would fail anyway. So it was never that things like that. So it, if the plane caught fire, if just absolutely anything, the maintenance folks in Louisville would know it that quick. And, and the reason why they pay for that too is, um, I'm trying to think of something. For the North Pacific, I've still got eight hours to get to Hong Kong. They can call Hong Kong and try and find that part and have it there waiting to put in the second we land. Instead of waiting for me to get in radio range and say, Hey, uh, we've got a couple problems that you're going to have to fix. And so, but, but that's only with the Dash 8, the, the newest one. And, and a lot of the airplanes, civilian lines, are that way now, too. I mean, it's a great capability to know way ahead of time if you're going to have to fix. Or, and sometimes they can troubleshoot, too. What is the most exciting thing? that happened to you while you were flying? Oh, exciting good or exciting bad? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've seen a lot of great sunsets and a lot of beautiful countrysides. And, and Did you 
Did you ever have any mechanical problem that really got your heart going fast? No, no, not really. I mean, and, and you're trained so much. I, in civilian life, I never had to shut an engine down. Um, I guess weather, some of the weather things, because, you know, you always had to try. In the Air Force, you can go, hey, the weather's bad in Guam. We're not taking off, whatever. Well, civilian-wise, you got to make an attempt to go out to the runway and take off. Now, the weather's just... So, or you got to make an attempt to land, and of course, if it was so bad, go around, and go to an alternate field or whatever. But even if there's a hurricane and it's forecast to be at Taipei or Hong Kong, you know, hurricane if it's at the right time, you might be able to land. But probably weather things were more, and, and you would sit there for 12 hours on the flight going, well, how's the weather now? How's the weather now? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and you get with your dispatcher and weather guy, well, we think at the time you're going to arrive, the wind's going to be like 50 knots. And, and, and not so much for crossing, you know, I mean, anyway. But probably with weather things. So. Sure. I put a pail on your speech here, but uh, oh. I have a, a real serious question to ask. I have a good sure. friend of mine who was, uh, killed in Vietnam by a refueler. And uh, the way it came about is they were refueling a jet and uh, there was a spark or whatever in the connection or whatever happened then I've heard it explained. But not, very, but not very well by experts, okay? You're an expert. Well, um, Rob, Rob, it, 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 uh, it killed him and it killed everyone in the refueler. It, it was just a complete mm. blow up. Everything went. I was just wondering how often does something like that happen? So, uh, when I flew, now Rob was. Never heard of it. Flew in Vietnam. Uh, that connection was grounded between the two planes, and then we've got static wick uh, that's off the wings that can release. Uh, static electricity. Uh, so in the connection, it's never happened. Now we lost a couple crews when I was in because uh, in the fuel tanks are hydraulic pumps that either pump the fuel to the engine or pump the fuel to the other airplane. And they found out those were going bad and when in each tank those pumps would become uncovered below 3,000 pounds of fuel. And if the crews let them, well, and sometimes we run tanks empty, but if that hydraulic pump's still on, it would heat up so much, and in a vapor uh, type atmosphere, we, we did have to blow up the crews, and they grounded the fleet for a time until they figured that out, and then the fix initially, until they could replace all those pumps, is we had to keep so much fuel in the wing. So you to keep those pumps really, cool. It was a spark then, it was really something like mechanical. You know, unless that. you can go back and in the Air Force we call it Blue 4 News, which is uh, it had a fatality, and, and there would be like an FA written up thing about it. And, and unless I saw that, I, I really couldn't get okay. guess. You know, sorry. Uh, during your specialized training, were you ever subjected to waterboarding? Not sure. waterboarding. Um, in, they put us in a box. You did sleep deprivation. They played all kinds of crazy music, kept you cold and wet. And then they put you in this box that, you know, you'd be scrunched in this box and you'd start losing feeling in your hands and feet because, you know, the blood flow. And they knew just about how long to let that go. And then they kick you out of the box and then say, okay, so tell me your secrets. You know, I'm like, but no, never water for <laughs> Yeah, I just want to, uh, 
How long were you, if I understood you correctly, um, how long had you been in the Gulf and in the lead up to the Gulf War? And then, how, uh, did you uh, ever uh, uh, face or deal with uh, world leaders or even our defense, you know, whether it be well, Bush 41 or Baker? No, no. What was nice uh, with when we flew for General Schwarzkopf, we were never invited to any embassy functions or parties. But with General Hoare, as long as we were dressed appropriately, we could go meet the ambassador of whatever uh, and attend embassy functions. But that's about as high a food chain as I ever got. Um, we, we, I was gone from home about six months. So started in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia for several months, just a couple weeks up at Riyadh. And what I didn't say, after I was only in Riyadh for the first two days of the war, and I told you that scud thing. The colonel invited, there was like 12 of us aircraft commanders, and he says, we're starting a new unit in Monte Marsan, France. Who wants to go? Well, all 12 of us are like, and he goes, well, we sort of thought that. Schaefer and you, or whoever the other crew was, have been here the longest in theater, so you guys get to go. So, uh, my crew was never so excited. I thought my boom operator was going to kiss me. But, uh, <laughs> uh, well, that was another question. <laughs> were, were your boom operators enlisted? Yes. John, so what's it like flying in European airspace? Well, it's a lot, it's very restrictive, <laughs> and it's a lot tighter, and they have noise uh, restrictions and and because aviation is so popular, in most places you you get like a 10 mile corridor, you can be a little off course and stuff, but in Europe, you gotta be within a mile of the, of the course. And of course now, with GPS, that's not so hard. But, uh, and used to when we fly across the ocean, separation was 2,000 feet between aircraft going to Europe or aircraft coming to the States. Now that's 500 feet. And it's 500 feet, and it used to be 20 minutes apart, and it can be 10 minutes apart now. So you can be same altitude as somebody as long as you're at least 10 minutes behind them or in front or 500 feet separation. And they do it because it's so congested, but we've got autopilots and auto throttles and with satellite communication even though we may not be able to talk to them very well they can see us and but you can't speed up slow down left right you can do anything of course without a clearance unless you know you have an emergency and then there was a certain emergency you'd have to turn 45 degrees off the track and Climb a thousand and go down a thousand and parallel your track by 20 miles. <coughs> That's if you had something. So it had it. Yeah, it, a lot of flying, so it's getting congested, but the equipment can do it. It's just staying up with all the new regulations and stuff. I've kept you guys way over, so I apologize. <laughs>